All right, so recently I was underneath my big tilt deck gooseneck trailer. I was running some wires for some auxiliary lights and I noticed, you know, obviously it's a tilt deck trailer, it pivots and the pivot points are these really, really heavy duty hinges. And when I first got the trailer, I wonder, it's like, man, am I supposed to grease those? But nothing told me to and I didn't see any zerks down there. So I figured it was probably riding on some big like oil impregnated bronze bushings or something and nothing really to worry about. Well, anyway, I'm down there running those wires and there's what appears to be holes where the grease zerks should go and no grease zerks. And it doesn't look like any, fun, any fancy bronze or brass bushings either. It looks like just steel on steel hinges with absolutely no way to lubricate them. Now, could I be wrong? Absolutely. But from what I saw, that's all it is. And they've been without maintenance now for seven months of pretty regular use. So I figured I should fix that. <sighs> So I tried to keep some assortments of grease zerks around what for working on machinery and I found some of those I like. I did not have the proper size tap so I had to go on the interweb and order one and it finally showed up. So today that's what we are going to be doing. Could there be some, some bronze sleeves in this? Yes. I'm not saying there isn't. I don't see any. It's kind of close quarters. It's sort of hard to tell. Uh, I, I honestly think it's just steel on steel rubbing dry in there this whole time. but. Either way, this gives me an opportunity to uh, talk about something I've wanted to talk about for a while, which is sometimes people ask me what I've learned buying all this farm equipment. And I can tell you after two brand new tractors and probably about, I think, 13 tractors total, uh, plus several balers, a bunch of mowers, just all sorts of stuff, the main lesson I've learned is that you really can't assume anything. And this brings us back to the trailer. I, I just assumed it would be fine, and like I said, now there's a good chance it's just been steel on steel for more than half a year. I assume that if I had followed my own advice that I'm giving here and assumed nothing, this would not have happened. I would have fixed this last summer and there'd be a lot less wear on my once brand new trailer. I have learned that completely honest, very knowledgeable sellers of machinery are basically non-existent. You will find some very honest people who aren't that knowledgeable about that machine. Perhaps it's just an auction find, perhaps they inherited it from their great uncle Bob or whatever and they don't need it so they're selling it but they've never really run it themselves, they don't know anything about it. Uh, you will also find definitely a lot of dishonest people in the equipment world and the main group of people you will find are those that are just borderline incompetent. I'll give you an example of this. So this is my drum mower, this is one thing I use to cut hay. And this cylinder, as you can see, this is a cylinder that does not look anything like what actually fits in place on this. And you can see it really doesn't. I kind of had to make it fit. And the reason for this is the cylinder that came on this thing had a breather. The breather should have been installed facing downwards and it wasn't. It was installed facing upwards. So the cylinder got full of water, which I discovered uh, pretty much at the height of hay season once I got this thing out and started using it. And there's rusty water shooting out the breather cap and it won't hold pressure cost me hundreds of dollars and a major delay uh, It arguably the busiest time of the year. And why did this happen? I just assumed it came from the dealer, it should be fine. But you say, oh that's just new machinery, what about the older stuff? Well, my longer term viewers remember my Zetter 7711. I got this thing from a used tractor dealership. Said it runs, drives fine, drove it, drives fine, engine sounds fine. I just assumed it was fine and that the engine was generating oil pressure. Turns out it wasn't and it's self-destructed. Uh, it didn't even make it to the field. It's self-destructed on the way to the field. Cost me thousands of dollars and we had to rebuild this thing. Why? I just assumed it was fine. If I had assumed nothing and made sure that thing had a proper gauge on it, I would have caught that and fixed it for basically an afternoon's worth of labor. But instead, thousands of dollars and uh, I think it took about six months working on that off and on before it was really ready to go again. So these three groups of people, the ones who were honest but limited in knowledge, the ones who were blatantly dishonest, and the people who, you know, assemble machinery and, and put it together and whatnot and just haven't got a clue what they're doing, these three groups of people will make up, from my own personal first-hand experience, I would say approximately 80% of the people you will do business with when you're buying farm equipment, whether it's new or whether it's used. The point is, you cannot assume anything, period. This has been my new policy that I've adopted since the Zetter incident, and it's, I can't say I regret it. You know, case in point, I bought a new Land Pride Shredder last summer. Before I took this thing out to the field, I was pulling the dipstick out of that. I was making sure it had the proper amount of gear oil in it. Is it paranoid? 
Absolutely not. Quite frankly, after the experiences I've had, I'd be a fool to do otherwise. And the, and the Land Pride dealer, they did a wonderful job. Sure enough, you know, proper amount of oil, everything's fine, worked great. So my point with this, the advice I would give to anyone entering the farm machinery world is, say it with me, you cannot assume anything, period. If you buy a new piece of machinery, you need to crawl all over this thing. You need to check every single one of the fluids it has. You need to inspect the hydraulic system for loose hoses, leaks, breathers facing the wrong way, things along these lines. And if you buy used equipment, if you cannot demonstrate that something is working or if the seller cannot for you, you need to assume that it isn't. For example, if I had to do that Zetter thing again, you know, I get there, there's no functional oil pressure gauges on this thing. All right, I just assume it's not generating oil pressure and I would be out there, I'd take a wrench or something and undo the little thing where the, where the gauge goes in and if there's not oil pressure shooting out the side of that, I wouldn't have bought it. If there was, I'd say, it's probably fine, but I would have made sure that I put a real gauge on that before I actually took it to the field. And for the record, all it was was a loose pickup tube inside the engine. Could have saved all that, but obviously I didn't know that at the time. If you go to buy a piece of machinery, put it in all of its gears, in all of its ranges, forward and reverse everything it has. If it's a five-speed transmission, you only put this thing in four gears, you need to assume you're buying it with a completely non-functional fifth gear. This is why when people sell project tractors that neither run nor drive, like what parked, parked when ran special or whatever, like that Ford A20 over there, that's why these things are so cheap. Because people who actually know what they're doing learned this long before I did, and they know if it doesn't run, you assume it needs a full engine rebuild and a full transmission rebuild. If you go to buy a tractor and it doesn't steer right, and they say, oh, it's just a clogged power steering filter, then either get them to fix it or negotiate that deal or choose not to buy it based on the fact that it probably needs like a new power steering pump and all the hoses and the gearboxes messed up and all this other stuff. Why? Because if you assume it is just that $4 filter and then you get it home and you find out it's a $1,200 assembly, there's really nothing you can do. You say, oh, you take them to small claims court or whatever. You, I mean, you can, but I tried to take a former renter to small claims court who shafted me for about five grand in rent. I paid two, three hundred dollars in court fees and the sheriff's department in Travis County, Texas never even made an attempt to serve this person and eventually the case was, uh, I got a letter that said they were just going to dismiss it unless I gave him another, I think, two, three hundred dollars to keep it pending or keep it open however they worded it. You're not getting anything. That's the long and short of it. You need, at the very least, maybe you will but I would at least operate on the assumption you will get nothing. Once you have it, as is, where is, period. And again, you cannot assume anything, period. If I had gone into everything with this mentality, I would have had to fix a lot fewer problems on this machinery. All right, so I'm happy to report that the record for the most miserable grease-fitting installation of my entire life has officially been usurped. Uh, I don't really know what it was before, but it is definitely this job now. Over there, there's a functional grease fitting hole. Uh, it's a little lower than I'd like it to be, but with that angled fitting, I'm pretty sure it'll clear when this thing pivots. And then I got over here and discovered that the hole is in a completely different place, so I don't think it was structure, uh, strategically positioned over there. It's one of those deals they just put the hinge in wherever the hole was. That's where it was, because it's like way down there. I think you can see it a little bit. And... So I was like, that's not going to work, and I did what I now wish I'd done on the other side and just drilled a hole about in the center of this, and uh, hopefully uh, that one will clear. I'm pretty sure it'll clear. I put some green Loctite retaining compound on these grease zerks because it's not the greatest tapping job in the world, and uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to let those set over lunch, and then we'll, uh, I don't know, I'll give it an hour or so probably, and then we'll uh, shoot some grease in there. So here's a couple other things to keep in mind. Mechanic Steve told me once that, uh, and keep in mind, he deals more with heavy equipment than farm equipment and agricultural stuff. He said it is very, very rare for uh, a machine to end up on the used market unless there's something wrong with it. A lot of the time, I mean, there are plenty of cases where it'll be like an excavation company or whatever and they say, man, you know, this machine's been really good to us, and they've taken good care of it. They've done the service intervals on time, grease every morning, all these wonderful things. Uh, but they sit down and they figure out, man, if we had that machine instead of this one, 
We would have been done with that last job about 20% faster, and that means we'd be this far ahead on this job. That sounds really tempting right now. If they got some money to uh, lose before the end of the year so they don't have to pay taxes on it or whatever, then they just buy a new one and the old one ends up, you know, sold to whoever. These machines are out there, but for every one of those, there's a whole multitude of other machines where they'll have a mechanic check it out. The mechanic says, man, you know, these are known for this and that failure. I tell you what, you got about uh, maybe four or 500 hours left on this thing until that lets loose. When that happens, that's going to be a $20,000 repair. And they go, auction <laughs> and then the machine ends up on your trailer either directly from the auction or it goes to what we what we refer to on the agricultural side as a tractor jockey's lot like the one i bought the zetter from uh or you know something along those lines so you really have to my advice is assume there is something wrong with everything and try to figure out what it is now sometimes it is something major he says he's fixed things where it's basically nothing it's the sort of deal where you know machine just randomly dies and they they get fed up with it and they're like man the downtime on this is costing us more than payments on a new one so they sell it really cheap and it turns out to just be like a bad wire somewhere once they once someone can find these things and diagnose it it can be a pretty easy fix but operate on the principle that there is something wrong with every machine on the used market. Now something else to keep in mind is occasionally you will get a backstory on a piece of equipment. This doesn't happen all that often, especially with the older stuff like what I'm uh, stuffing my entire property with right now. But there are plenty of cases where someone will buy a tractor, let's say, and they decide, man, I really wish I'd bought the next size up. So they trade that one back in after a year or whatever, and now it's a perfectly good machine with a couple hundred hours on it, and there's nothing wrong with it, what's not to love. Now, the thing to be careful of with this type of equipment is if, if that's happened or just someone's needs straight up change, whatever the case may be, you gotta make sure as best as you can that they didn't decide to buy the new tractor after absolutely brutalizing and raping yours you know or the one you're looking at and then deciding to buy the bigger machine after yours has been overworked and had the daylight beat out of it for 500 hours first or something along those lines basically to sum all this up my advice for anyone in the equipment market especially with used equipment is you have to um, go about everything as if the machine it just dropped out of the sky into your yard and you're just the world's greatest mechanic and it's your job to make sure nothing goes wrong with this machine so you go through and check everything you must operate on the principle of you cannot assume anything period now with newer equipment I am a little more cynical than a lot of other people uh, but that's just based on my own personal first-hand experience. This trailer, it came, best I could tell, running metal on metal on the main pivots in this thing. It's uh, seven months old. I've already had to fiddle with the wiring some. It had a lot of sharp edges with wires running straight over them, like gouging the daylights out of the insulation. I've had to go through and fix this. I feel like I fixed something else with this. I don't know. I've bought two new tractors, a Mahindra that had electrical problems, and a Kubota that just purged like quarts of oil out the rear end of it anytime you drove it uphill until we got that taken care of. <sighs> My view on this, and whether you agree with it or not, I understand if you don't. I feel like I have had a little bit of a string of bad luck, not only with that, but with the New Holland Square Baler incident where New Holland Corporate really screwed me on that deal. Um, I operate on the principle of not only can you assume nothing, but as a consumer, when you buy something brand new in the 21st century, as unfortunate as it is, for the reasons we discussed earlier, you have no reasonable expectation in any way, shape, or form that it's just fine and it's ready to use and it's ready to go. You need to climb all over everything and make sure it actually has fluids and everything that's supposed to have fluids, make sure it has grease fittings and everything that's supposed to have grease fittings all of these things make sure everything is right beforehand and you're not going to catch everything if you have that one that one inch now to ten thousand that drops a valve when it's only 30 hours old there's not much you can do about that beforehand but another example this Kubota when I bought it the very first day I took it out I'm cruising down the road and I'm looking and this the left front wheels going like this one I hope we don't have a bent rim on this thing or whatever and then not very much longer after that, I took the wheels off that thing and I repositioned them to widen the stance of the tractor and it completely went away. 
So that tells me there's a very high chance that uh, this thing left the dealership with at least one bolt loose on one of its wheels, and that's why the wheel's going like, like I said, you cannot assume anything, period. And manufacturers, no matter what part of the world they're in, they usually get things right with farm equipment. The problem is normally the dealers. It's the person who's getting paid 10 bucks an hour and he bolts the hydraulic cylinder on upside down. It's the person who, like, who didn't torque that one wheel down. If you can figure out what the dealer does to a piece of equipment, I would really double check that before you get it. Again, check the fluids, make sure things are tight, things along those lines. Normally with tractors, they ship without wheels on them, you know, if they come from other countries or whatever, so it's fairly standard that they'll bolt the wheels and tires on here. That's what Mahinder does, and then they label them assembled in Texas. I don't know if they still do, but that's what they were doing when I bought mine. And, uh, and normally they add the front end loaders and everything. So check those hoses, check, uh, check all the stuff basically. And like I said, whether you agree with it or not, I now operate on the principle if you have no reasonable expectation to believe that machine is going to be field ready once you get it. And uh, so far that's working out very well for me. I've not had any problems after I adopted this. But if nothing else, remember, you cannot assume anything when it comes to buying especially used machinery that's the big one you really can't assume anything you can't take any chances and uh, hopefully this video will save you some money if i had watched this video a few years ago it would have saved me a lot of time a lot of money and quite a few headaches uh, anyway thanks for watching don't forget to rate comment and subscribe for more It'll probably be controversial but i don't really care like i said this is all documented first-hand experience i've had and uh, ultimately i can just go off of what i've seen so thanks for watching don't forget to rate comment and subscribe for more cheers